So now I have to probably, hopefully not, to wake you up um, to also to talk about cardioversion and um, catheter ablation, which I think it's very important. However, we already had some um, discussion, and I thought that is uh, that was very fruitful before our break about the occurrence actually of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. And, um, and this actually is of utmost importance, especially if you do cardioversion or if you do a catheter ablation. And the aspect is shown here that actually you do not need to have, to have atrial fibrillation at the time of stroke or very closely related. So this trial actually showed that um, at a time of stroke shown here in the middle, where's here, that uh, actually many patients did not have an episode of atrial fibrillation 180 days prior to stroke. Or some of them actually developed atrial fibrillation after the stroke actually already occurred. So at, at least these data suggest, at least to some extent, that with regard to occurrence of stroke, atrial fibrillation may also be an epiphenomenon, so to speak. And we have already discussed the issue of the Virchow's triad, um, which actually summarizes alterations in blood flow and also activation of the clotting system, but thrombi do not develop within the cavity. They always develop at the endocardial surface, at the endocardium, so you have to have vascular abnormalities. And the question really is, do those abnormalities really necessary um, depend on the presence of atrial fibrillation when actually these issues occur. So um, last year actually we, um, under the guidance of ERA, actually we sat together and we defined for the first time the term of atrial cardiomyopathy. And I think this is very important because we included all the different um, arrhythmia associations around the globe and we came up with a very simple definition but we think that this is actually very important really not only to have a pathological classification of different cardiomyopathies, but also to explain why you do not have to have atrial fibrillation all the time for the occurrence of stroke. And actually from the molecular studies, we do know from patient samples with atrial fibrillation and without atrial fibrillation, also from animal studies, we actually came up with a term it's called thrombogenic endocardial remodeling. And actually this process, which is now very well defined also on the molecular scale, it can be explained why actually the chats vas score is a risk score to suffer a stroke. Because all these parameters interfere with the left atrial myocardium much more than with the right atrial uh, myocardium. And that explains why actually these people do get systemic embolism and stroke and not pulmonary embolism because the left atrial endocardium is differently in comparison to the right uh, endocardium. And one of the main aspects really is the occurrence of oxidative stress, which is related to aging factors, to diabetes, to hypertension, to congestive heart failure. And all these factors and parameters persist, of course. Even though the patient is in sinus rhythm, these factors are there and they drive the development of stroke at the endocardial surface, and that explains why actually you do not have to have atrial fibrillation all the time. So this really might be a pathophysiological basis, and also we can clearly show and dissect different parameters where you can actually inter see interaction of clotting factors with certain receptors. You can see how it interferes with concomitant diseases, and actually this is boosted in a positive feedback loop by the presence of atrial fibrillation. So if you do have activation of the clotting system, with all these molecular changes and atrial fibrillation, then you have a very pro-thrombogenic state, especially in the left atrial appendage where actually clot formation is caused. So this, I think, is very important because it explains why these patients require longer-term anticoagulation and not only during the days or weeks when they actually do have atrial fibrillation. And this is, of course, also the case if you do um, a cardioversion or a catheter ablation because then always the question comes up, well, if you do not see atrial fibrillation anymore on the surface ECG, can you actually stop um, the anticoagulation? 
and these pathophysiological background may probably help to explain why at least at a certain risk stage it might not be safe to do so. So the strategy which is still valid then is if you do a cardioversion that you have to pretreat, of course all patients with an anticoagulant because you want to change the rhythm and you want to interfere with atrial fibrillation. So for that reason in many areas of the world actually uh, patients are pretreated for at least three weeks to perform cardioversion safely or which is also done especially in Germany and the northern European countries for example or in the United States actually a transesophageal echo is a preferred method before a cardioversion is done and then of course you do not need to pretreat the patients for three weeks. So what is the basis for this? It's of course because we know that not application of electrical current or a drug really induces thrombo uh, gen uh, thrombogenesis in the atrium. It's not the cardioversion itself. It's actually re related to the underlying mechanism before you actually cardiovert that a clot is already there and that is the reason why if you do not do a TE guided approach a pretreatment phase is necessary and that also explains why actually stroke occur days and potentially weeks after successful cardioversion because if you do have restoration of mechanical function of the HR then actually a dislodgement of the thrombus can occur and that induces or may induce a stroke. So what is the basis so far? And you can see that these data are very old with very small sample size. And actually there is not much present in the literature before actually all the uh, different NOACs were assessed with regard to cardioversion. You can see in these very small cohorts that of course with regard to electrical or pharmacological cardioversion the likelihood to suffer a stroke is limited to up 1.2 percent. However, <laughs> Due to these numbers and the low event rate, of course, none of the trials had any really true significance. However, I think this is definitely the basis, which actually is the only or all summarizes all the different publications so far with regard to cardioversion. And also with regard to TEE, also it's done on a regular basis in the European countries and the US, for example, the numbers really un analyzing the effect of a TEE is very limited. So a total of 2,000 patients actually gave rise to this TEE guided approach, which can actually show that, of course, without the pretreatment phase, you can perform a cardioversion if you initiate anticoagulation after the cardioversion itself. So coming from this historical data, of course, I think now we have started to learn a lot coming also from the phase three trials as well as from the cardioversion trials dealing with the NOACs. And of course all the three phase three trials included also patients in four trials then, uh, included patients undergoing cardioversion and in these meta-analysis where actually also one prospective trial was included, you can see that there is really no impact overall on the occurrence of stroke and also on the occurrence of bleeding. However, this meta-analysis was really a mixture between retrospective post hoc analyses and the prospective data. So the first prospect, uh, prospective trial was uh, the XWORD trial. And uh, they did, I think, an interesting approach because they analyzed before they initiated the protocol all the different scenarios how cardioversion is performed. And there are substantial regional differences how cardioversion is performed. Like in Italy, usually patients are cardioverted pharmacologically. In the northern countries, most of the patients are cardioverted electrically. And also, TE guided approach is used and non TE guided approach. And all these different scenarios are actually included in this protocol. And for that reason, of course, you got several different subgroups. Um, but these subgroups resemble, of course, the clinical setting where cardioversion is, of course, performed. However, it shows that a simple procedure like a cardioversion is not that simple and that it might be very difficult, really, to assess all the different uh, subgroups per se. However, overall, putting all these different subgroups back together again, you can see that the likelihood that someone really suffers a stroke or suffers a major bleeding event 
was very low. So this shows that actually cardioversion using rivaroxaban can be safely performed. However, due to the very low numbers, of course, um, the trials were not powered. And we also did a trial using optimized um, anticoagulation with warfarin plus anoxaparin because due to the short treatment period it may take a couple days until actually a true anticoagulative uh, level of INR might be reached. So for that reason we try to be um, very precise and to have similar treatment durations in all the different uh, groups. And what we did was uh, we just went for electrical cardioversion to, cre uh, to keep the different treatment period stable throughout the trial because you exactly know when an electrical cardioversion is performed and then you can start counting your days. So of course we had a TE guided approach and we had a non-TE guided approach because I already mentioned the variability in the different strategies to perform this and we had this optimized uh, standard control. And of course, um, we came up with the largest trial, so 2,199 patients were randomized, about 1,000 patients per group. So the whole trial was larger, actually, than the sum of all the trials together we had so far. Um, and the main results also is shown here that there was a trend uh, towards reduced strokes, reduced bleeding events, regardless of the used TE strategy. However, <coughs> the absolute numbers were low, so low, that uh, there was no uh, really uh, statistical significance. So similar to the efficacy endpoint, also safety was the same. There was really no trend. However, you can see that bleeding event overall, like 32 versus 35, was very low. So this actually shows that cardioversions using NOAC or using standardized approach using anoxaparin and warfarin can be used very safely. And that actually underscores and underlines the basis why actually such a procedure is done so often in the routine clinical practice. So and also kidney function hour study did not have an impact at all. So of course, we do have to have this scheme. We do need this pretreatment phase to be um, uh, effective if you do not want to use a TE, also due to the pathophysiology. And this is also the same if you do a catheter ablation because so far we are not sure that catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation really cures the disease. It may cure probably the arrhythmia, however the underlying pathophysiology may not be changed at all. So for that reason, of course, it's still to be debated how long these patients need adequate anticoagulation. However, there are data coming from the uh, vitamin K history, actually, that continuous vitamin K therapy might be better than to interrupt. Because usually um, physicians fear, of course, bleeding events, and for that reason, they try to actually stop warfarin before you do a, uh, before you do a catheter ablation to reduce bleeding events. However, this trial showed that the opposite is true. So actually interruption of warfarin increased rate of bleeding and increased also rate of stroke. So for that reason, of course, um, to having also data on NOAC might be <coughs> ideal because um, it would simplify the procedure. So there are data from the Adventure AF published and Adventure actually also had again a f um, cohort where actually pretreatment was done or a TE guided approach using rivaroxaban versus a vitamin K antagonist, and then catheter ablation was performed. However, the question really is then when actually the last tablet of the NOAC is actually taken. And I think this is of great clinical importance, and we have to see how all the other trials are doing, because from a clinical setting, it's very important if you have to take a tablet the day of the procedure or the evening before or the last even uh, the last morning before the procedure, the next day is done and so on. So for that reason, I think it's very important to get all these data from the different trials. So of course, catheter ablation was used, and what they did was that actually the last tablet of rivaroxaban was taken the evening before the ablation. So I think this is an important point, that actually they did not interfere with the continuous 
application of rivaroxaban. However, they did not use a morning dose, they used an evening dose. And of course, they initiated rivaroxaban six hours after uh, sheath removal and continued then. So actually, they could show, and these are the classical demographics, that uh, actually there was um, no difference with regard to the overall bleeding. I will show this a little bit later. However, there was differences with regard to heparin use. And this is we, uh, something we have to remember as clinical interventionalists that, of course, regular techniques to, ap uh, to apply heparin, for example, might be affected by the use of a NOAC. So actually, the dose of heparin was higher in patients treated with the rivaroxaban to keep ACT level about 300 seconds. So however, um, there was no impact on uh, substantial bleeding or uh, stroke events in adventure. So in last week actually in uh, Washington at the ACC, the other trial was published, uh, the Recircuit trial, and they used the Dabigatran in comparison to Wafrin to undergoing, in patients undergoing catheter ablation. Uh, the trial was larger, encompassing uh, 700 patients, and uh, they found actually that, of course, uh, dabigatran was an adequate alternative um, to Wafrin in patients undergoing catheter ablation. However, they did something different. Their approach was that dabigatran was actually allowed to be taken the morning before the procedure. So this is uh, something probably a tricky, tiny point, however, an important point, and also they initiated then dabigatran again, 150 milligram twice a day, three hours after sheath removal, and they could show that there was, um, with regard to the overall effect, that actually dabigatran um, was doing uh, better with regard to uh, those primary endpoints defined in the trial. So they actually also showed that, uh, of course, it's a true and a good alternative to perform a catheter ablation with a NOAC in this setting. However, at this point, of course, we have to make sure that we understand all protocols. And, of course, all the different little tiny aspects really have to be remembered. There is another ongoing trial from the German AFNet. And uh, I think that this trial also goes in a similar direction where Apixaban is studied in patients undergoing catheter ablation. And I think that uh, the trial will be terminated, or not terminated, recruitment will be terminated in April the 10th, so in two weeks. And we will see how uh, Apixaban actually is doing in our study. So overall, I think um, from all the data, I think NOACs, of course, work well in patients undergoing cardioversion, in patients undergoing catheter ablation. We have to see how the other trials are doing. I think the pathophysiology has to be remembered uh, with regard to the discussion about the length of therapy. Of course, due to the very low um, occur or event rates with regard to ischemic or bleeding events, of course, we have to remember that actually none of these trials is adequately powered really to assess efficacy. However, it's just not doable to perform a study like this because you would have to have more than 10,000 patients per arm, per treatment arm, really to get uh, true if effective data. However, um, also we have to realize that not all subgroups will be studied in prospective randomized trials. Also, this is not doable. However, I think the recipe really how to use a NOAC in a certain situation must become clear from all the different protocols and all the different trials because this will affect clinical um, settings and the clinical routine tremendously.